honorable and perfectly self-enlightened worshippers Buddha, consummated in knowledge and behavior. Hello to you friends. This is Dhamma on Air number 132. The second in series of Dhamma conversation with Venerable Dhamma Gavesi from Sri Lanka and UK on all aspects of the Dhamma here under the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Way. And you are indeed welcome and thank you for your attention. Friends, what is this sublime right concentration? The Noble Eightfold Way leading to Nirvana is simply this right view, right motivation, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right awareness, and right concentration. But what is right concentration? The Buddha explained the fourfold definition of right concentration exactly like this. Having eliminated the five mental hindrances, the mental defects that obstruct understanding, while quite secluded from sensual desires, protected from any detrimental mental state, one enters and dwells in the first jhana, full of joy and pleasure born of solitude, joined with directed and sustained thought. One makes this joy and pleasure, born of seclusion, drench, saturate, soak, and suffuse the entire body, so that no part of the body is unperfused by this intense joy and pleasure. Just as a skilled bathman puts soap powder in a copper basin and sprinkling it gradually with water, whips it until the water soaks and pervades all the soap powder and making it into foam, yet without dripping, so too does a noble friend make the joy and pleasure born of solitude permeate and pervade this entire body. Again, friends, with the stilling of directed and sustained thought, one enters and dwells in the second jhana, a calm assurance of unification of mind, with even deeper joy and pleasure, now born of concentration, devoid of any thought. One makes this exquisite joy and pleasure, born of concentration, Drench, saturate, soak, and suffuse the entire body, so that no part of the whole body is unperfused by this profound joy and pleasure. Just as a lake whose waters welled up below within itself and it had no other source, neither by showers of rain nor from any other river. Then this cool fount of water, whirling up from deep within the lake itself, would immerse, fill, and pervade the entire body. Even and exactly so, the sun make this joy and pleasure born of concentration, infuse this entire body. Furthermore, friends, with the fading away of the joy, the noble friends dwells in even equanimity, just aware and clearly comprehending, still feeling pleasure in the body. One enters upon and remains in the third jhana, regarding which the noble ones declare, in aware equanimity one dwells in pleasure. One makes this pleasure Apart from joy, flood, saturate, soak and suffuse the body, so there is no part of one's whole body unperfused by this pleasure divested of joy. 
just as in a lotus pond. Some lotuses are born, grow and thrive immersed under the water, and the cool water soaks them from their roots to their tips. So too does the noble friend make the pleasure divested of joy, fill, flood and pervade this entire body. Finally, friends, with the leaving behind of both pleasure and pain, and with the prior disappearance of both gladness and sadness, one enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, a completely still mental state of awareness, purified by equanimity of neither pain nor pleasure. One sits illuminating the body internally with his pure bright mind, so there is no part of one's whole body not illuminated by this pure bright mind. Just as a man was sitting covered from the head down with a white cloth, so that no part of his whole body was uncovered by this white textile. Even so does one sit encompassing this entire body with a pure, bright and radiant mind, so there is no part of one's whole body not illuminated by this pure, bright and luminous mind. Needless to say, friends, no trivial worldly pleasure can ever surpass such sublime bliss. The function of right our concentration and its associate is seeing right versus wrong concentration. As right versus wrong concentration is right view. Exchanging wrong concentration with right concentration is right effort. Right concentration functions as a drill, focusing, unifying and penetrating. Concentration thus induces an intense breakthrough into the Absolute. On how to attain the jhana absorption, search for jhana on what Buddha said.net. And for further study on Buddhist right concentration, Sangma Samadhi, there's the jhanas in Theravada Buddhist meditation, it is wheel number 45.pdf. Or there is the path of purification the complete manual on meditation and absorption, the path of purification, also free on what Buddha said.net. Thank you. It was a false sense of security calculating this inside my head. Make, giving me some assurance that I had a prosperous future because I had all these things like if I had a house and if I bought it for whatever the price and today the market value is such I calculate the market value hmm. I haven't I don't want to sell the house but I want to calculate the market value constantly giving me a false sense of uh, assurance yeah so Becoming a monk, one of the main things that I've let go on is this mental calculation of... Always ongoing, huh? It, How it can I exchange this to get more pleasure right. and to maintain my pleasure? Right. Even though I may be realizing later down the road that maintaining this pleasure is meaningless in itself. Right. So the, the freedom in my mind, the word Viveka, that has come because there's no calculation no more, there's no bank account no more, there's no purse no more, there's nothing saved for a future, mm. there's no assurances of medical insurance, nothing. But wanting to spend 24 hours and not have to think about how to provide this. Mm. Words of happiness is not enough to mm. explain. Mm. True, true, yeah. true. Uh, I was just, just like a note. Now you say calculation. In, 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 to some extent, if you look at modern life, to have all these in pension schemes uh, and economy and so on, this whole thing that you have to maintain, uh, I think also is, is lulling people into complacency yeah. that eventually they will have to die. 
and then they they will have to experience the consequences of their actions yeah. and that they 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 never can you that the whole idea that you can actually maintain your pleasure level huh? yeah. that you will will require that you don't become old and there's no impermanence huh? this is this is uh, lulling you into some kind of saying ah uh, i can keep it up uh, what cannot be kept uh, if i just make these pension schemes and insurances and calculations the right way then i will end up with it uh, one uh, interesting note in this regard uh, is that a very very uh, very very rich uh, person that is very well known in denmark i won't mention the name has a lot of shops that sells beds and uh, furniture and so forth he come from jutland uh, he's exorbitantly rich. Uh, I don't think the richest person in Denmark, but among the top five. Huh? And so he just have been diagnosed with uh, with a cancer. Yeah. And of course, he his his it, it may kill him. In 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 the end. and now he has a very poor quality of life. So one can say, uh, the lesson learned there is yes, whatever insurance you have, whatever bank account you have, how many, how many your how big your business imperium is or however big your army is, still, you're prone to impermanence. So true. You're prone to suffering, huh? It'll come and bang your head uh, when you, you less expect it. Then suddenly, so you can say, all these assurances, uh, trying to put in socks here and there in this dike that is leaking, well, uh, they, there comes a lot of less water out for a, a shorter point of time, but eventually, the dike of existence samsara will break down. Huh? Exactly. Uh, so, but, uh, it's only in this sasana as monks we are able to speak using the word of impermanence. Mm. In that other side of that wall, in that social world, Bante, this word impermanence is not something they would want to admit with. No, no, right? true. So these people in this conventional world, the majority who are exhausted with whatever they are going through are always measured on one of two problems. One is whatever they have gathered up to now, which is in the present moment to the past. There is an uh, auditable element that you can physically measure. You could, people have memory about mm. what you have had. Their wealth. A, a wealth, Bante, about their performances, what they've said, what they've done. Mm things that can be assessed to say that person is a good person, wrong, bad person, mm. a prosperous person, was a rich person, like mm. this. You can say many things. Mm. Though the future that is uncertain, that is unknown, yeah, with no fixed ending, that element is also measured. And it is measured by the uh, way somebody could uh, invest into a future. Yeah, I can have an investment property mm. and then say I have such a thing and I'm, I'm worth so much. Mm. I can have a life insurance, so I'm worth more dead than alive. Hmm? Uh, um, I have insurances, I have um, uh, what do you call uh, warranties. I have bought a refrigerator and I have a 10 year guarantee. Mm. But it doesn't <laughs> say anything. No. But it gives all these people a false sense of security. Because that is what this society likes to measure themselves with. Mm, mm. But the moment you come inside the Dhamma, now the naturality of the impermanence is the only thing we measure ourselves with. Mm. We don't go back into our past, but we look at what this future that is uncertain with, why it is so uncertain, and now learn how not to get exhausted with these unknown uncertainties. And I think if society can take a pinch of this in their meal, like salt. Today, we will have a very different, peaceful, calm society. Society, I, I agree. You can say a side effect with this insurance scheme and this uh, calculation that there's so and so much on the bank account and then so and so much in the pension scheme. I think this is seen from a Dhamma point of view, a Buddhist point of view, it, it inherently induces complacency, huh? because then you don't need to do more, so to speak. Huh? Uh, so you, you, are, you feel safe uh, in the sense that uh, you don't need to do anything else than that maintaining these bank accounts and these pension schemes. 
However, seen from a Dharma point of view, one is still prone to death, one is still prone to suffering, one is still prone to having a next life that is according to whatever one has done in this life. Huh? So there I think one feels a more acute uh, danger, a dinava, huh? danger with samsara, that this can be ripped away, it, you, you, you feed your body, uh, your living circumstances, it can be ripped away, even your sanity can be ripped away in any particular moment it should be. And you don't know, and you don't know. So now is the time, now, not tomorrow, now is the time to shape the future in a sense that you know brings real happiness by going with the Dhamma, yeah. by going with the Dhamma. Yeah. I, th I think this is what one could share uh, with the Western world in so Indian. So Indian. Uh, and, uh, greater the opportunity the Western world is given to investigate themselves with, as to understand with, through their own intelligence or their own assessment or their own language as to why things are as they are. As they are. I think it's adequate. Uh, many people have come to this Bhante and asked, saying, we've read books about causation Bhante. What is this causation? Before going too far, just look at you and just ask yourself if there was a past in your life, have you asked why the past was so? And you'll always see that your past is always annotated with the word because. This happened because. Because I of this or that. Because. Uh, uh, so then you take time to understand what this annotation of word be cause mean this being the cause mm. this is so mm. so now the, inter, the the wisdom is to ask who is causing this or what is causing it first of all who uh, is causing it uh, uh, momentarily you point the finger says i am uh, the cause of it yeah sure 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh. now though i am the cause who have you been blaming up to now now the admittance of ignorance, of delusion comes saying, Oh, I blamed everybody around me other than me, but I'm the cause. Yeah, yeah, true, 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 and true. you hide behind this Pante. Yeah. So, then you... Slowly, Victimize. Exactly. Then you take a slowly further discussion as to what this causation is about, what this Tanha is about, how this uh, Baba Tanha, Vibhava, all this, uh, the, the integrity associated with that should be brought once the person has begun to admit this naturality in this way. Mm. There, mm. I think society gets such an understanding of what this self is about and why this self mm. is, is this way about. I think this is a good, a, a good taking point because you can say in the entire Western world at the moment, one will say uh, both politically and also individually that uh, the cause of my unhappiness, let's say there is some unhappiness, then the usual melody goes like this, that this unhappiness comes from outside. It is something that one has, has to experience because of circumstances. Either it comes from a political instability, or it comes from a structure at work, it comes from one's boss, or from one's wife, or one's family relations, or whatever. Uh, one thing is for sure, one is not involved oneself. And as Bande say, I agree, it's right to take it uh, internal and say, ah, but I, I was involved because I, I, I have placed, placed myself both by karma and by active choice in these and that circumstances. So I cannot go scot-free uh, because I, I, I've basically chosen it myself. Uh, I think taking it one step further to say uh, who has created this suffering in seen from a, a Buddhist point of view, yeah, then the Buddha, he would say uh, ignorance and craving. Exactly. Huh? Yes. Avicca and Tanna. Ignorance and craving, they are the creators uh, of suffering. Uh, you can say then ignorance of what? Basically, very deep down, ignorance of the Four Noble Truths. And so, uh, we come circle around. If, if, we, if we as monks and, uh, can come with the core of the Dhamma, of these Four Noble Truths, of suffering, of craving as the cause of suffering, and absence of craving as the end of suffering, and this noble Eightfold Way as the method and the praxis to stop this suffering, then much is achieved. But I don't think we are there uh, yet, uh, because we have to make some, some catch-up. I think the, 
the, the catch for, for the Western world is calm, is peace, because they feel a lot of stress. Okay. But, but one most simple technique, I, I think this, this uh, Western world or, or the whole world one day is missing a little investigative system or technique in here. Now, when you take a child, it's very easy to expose this Dhamma to them. Mm. Okay, because of their innocence. Mm. If you ask a child whether they have anything they like, naturally they'll say, yeah, I have. So, like say, chocolates. I like chocolate. Okay. So, the next question to ask is, have you received the chocolates you like at the time you like it, where you like it, the amount you like it? And the answer is no. Never. <laughs> so, if you like chocolates and didn't get it the way you want, the time you want, the amount you want, yeah? Are you a happy person or a sad person? Naturally, they say, I'm a sad person. Are you angry or kind? I'm angry. Whom are you angry with? Then they say, oh, the one who's not giving me chocolates. Amma and Appa. Yeah. Mother and father. Now you hmm. say, hold on. Who chose chocolates as something you like? You or your mother or father? Ah, no. I chose it. Did you have the freedom to choose this? Yeah. So if you have the freedom to choose and you choose chocolates as I like, and now that you've chosen it, you don't get it the way you like it, the amount you like at the time you like, why are you blaming other people? Hmm. Stop choosing. Hmm. So if this world begins to see that lesser the things you like, lesser the things you dislike, less are the things you need and want and bring about something about simplicity of minimalized naturality. Auntie, this world is going to be so calm. Economically, mentally. Mentally. Yeah, mentally. socially. First, mental calmness within these people and moment these people are a little calmer, their tolerances change. And the moment their tolerances change, they begin to accommodate and accept other people around that brings the world peace around. Hmm. You have to start doing something with this word PA Hivipa Yoga Dukko. If you like something, he says that you're going to be exhausted with it. A PA Hisampa Yoga, if you dislike something. Now, for instance, one day this tree. If you say, I don't like this tree, well, it's going to be here. But now you chosen not to like it. You have to be exhausted with the way you don't because like it. Because it is here. Because uh, it's here. Uh, 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 Just because you don't like it, it doesn't go uh, away. Uh, no. So an important point here, I think, for the Western world and for the but you can say for anyone is just so the moment you choose, as you say, yeah. not only the chocolate, but to be in the world. Yeah. To, to be in the social conventions of uh, work life, economical life, but also to be in the world that where, where you're seeking the sweetness of sex, drugs and rock and roll, you can say, uh, then inherently one also chooses suffering. Exactly. Uh -huh. right. And if you, let's say also, to some extent also, let's say you want to be free from it, uh, you choose not to, then you also create suffering. Huh? Exactly. Because it's that now there is something that is pushing away, there's some repulsion there. Huh? So it is one's own choice, intentional choice, that is creating this suffering. But this intentional choice, uh, even though it's very fundamental, I think often we don't realize that we make it a choice. So uh -huh. We don't realize it's subconscious, and because there's this social convention, you can only choose what there is apparently. Huh? But actually, that this uh, there, there are some guys with these robes that uh, goes into the forest. It, it not, not so many. It, it, it points to that there is actually is an alternative. One can choose yes. something else. Exactly. One can choose something so, else. So that, that's why one day, even with the enlightenment, there are certain things that you just have to do as the path of that enlightenment. But it's the abhisankara, the, the, the excessiveness that you now participate yourself with mm -hmm. to bringing fun, to, to bring this occupational entertainment mm -hmm. that, that you have to reduce in some way. Mm. Such a, you know, if you look at this world one day, this world is constantly offering you a choice to choose from. 
whether you like it or not hmm. that's a choice now if the two of us take there's many things around us to look at hmm. we have a choice to choose from and we can choose which tree or which bit to look at hmm. in this naturality when you realize that this world is offering you this variety with this abundance hmm. and i don't have to take nobody's permission to choose hmm. so therefore i choose hmm. you uh, get ca- you get caught up in the diversity in all the colors and forms and uh, alternatives and exactly uh, 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 now we begin to explain the tanha hmm. in this way hmm. now bante if you are kept in a prison and your mobility with your faculties have been reduced suddenly that choice that you have to come into contact with the variety reduces mm. momentarily causing a, a, a aversion inside you now want to break out and run around mm. so you only need to take a person lock them in a room and leave yeah <laughs> strong aversion ah uh-huh. strong frustration exactly but so now call the prison huh yeah so physical prison we talk, we call it physical prison now one day you have to talk about your own physical body hmm and how inside this own physical body you are in prison hmm when you're not allowed to be mobile with it hmm hmm so when you're not allowed to take take yourself to a shop or a party or whatever hmm. we are because that pleasurable choice that variety is 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 um, um, stop yes yeah, stop i when i said this variety this diversity of all these uh, sense stimuli and all these things we can choose to look this way and that way and so on seek this and that then i came to think about yes but uh, maybe that's why meditation works because actually when you close your eyes uh, and you close your ears and and try to uh, be still in a silent place then uh, the diversity the the amount of choices that you can make is drastically reduced right? drastic you don't see anything uh, you, you maybe hear something but it's very little compared to before so uh, you stop choosing to some extent huh? yeah. you stop choosing all you have you still have to choose to sit on the pillow but uh, the, it's a, a gross gross maybe a factor 10 or 100 and maybe even thousand less choices that you have to make on the pillow than you have to make in the external world right. so bante what you just said if you go back to the social world that we that 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 we are trying to explain in a way and you take one transaction of somebody watching t- television you ask them are you watching television or are you listening to the television and they would not know how to answer you could only do one thing at one time you could either watch or you could listen now for you to follow what's going on in the dialogue and with the motion how quickly is your mind alternating between your eye and the ear and the sense of meaning also oh. the mind yeah but now yeah. when you try to take while you're eating something yeah. and and sitting in a place with yeah. comfort yeah. it's quickly switching ah. mm. so now if you take that the conventional world mm. those that are living in that conventional world always teased always tempted tempted with these tools mm. of technology and the totality mm. Mm. and their mind is alternating so fast mm. Mm. and as you just explained the word meditation mm. what if they come and get to show, close their eyes for a while reduce the choice and variety and just take a break hmm from that alternating mind quickly 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 exactly. quickly this is what should be encouraged without religion hmm uh without no anything other than this is what retreat is about is about exactly get away from your environment stop role play stop being the role and role play don't take no responsibility just take a break from choice of sense variety exactly uh, yeah i can also one can add that uh, usually we become addicted to this particular stimuli also there are, there are many of them just think about the television channels now there are thousand television channels you have netflix and uh, all these uh, there are thousands of programs you can uh, choose about so the choice uh, paradoxically 
we think about is like say uh, the more choice we have the more films we have the more uh, food we can eat the more happy we become however it seems from from the lesson here we learn here and in the western world when the number of choices go up then we become even more addicted but it also we become more stressed because we have to sip 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 also within seeing the film we have to sip sip between the senses to get the, the stimuli so it it becomes a kind of like a rapidly exploding uh, problem where the suffering becomes greater and greater because there's more and more alternatives to choose from both in the single moment and for the single person but also in general in society as such so it's the opposite way around the more choice there is the more you become addicted the more suffering you experience while the, the, the buddhist melody is the exact opposite to simplify 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 until there's only one thing and this is this peace this mental calm that that is in the bhavana then one feels happiness so if you can feel happiness with only one thing in your mind so to speak ikkagata chitta why why seek all this external junk it's not needed it's happiness that we seek in the first place anyway that's the purpose of life and i think it's a legitimate purpose it is to be happy nibbana is also happiness huh? and the kakas don't want to hear this dhamma <laughs> uh, one who wants to associate with such a practice also has to have an attitude and that simplest of attitude that is that it is okay for other people to have what they have and i don't need to have the same thing they have hmm okay so abhijja uh, domanasa uh, hmm uh, covetousness hmm. just because they have doesn't mean i also have to have hmm. so the one who creates this uh, individualized attitude to say that i don't need to be compared with anybody i'm just going to enjoy what i have what i've gathered and i'm not going to compete with other people that person that attitude bante will bring adequate calmness hmm around, hmm, you know, hmm. Right? that we don't measure measure yeah. up yeah okay i think we should uh, change a little bit gear because uh, now we have talked about the symptoms uh, and not so much about the praxis if you um, Uh, I think we we should we should tell a little bit about how our because we have gone some 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 way on the path huh? how has your praxis developed over the years since you met uh, Bande Selagavesi and also before when you were a layman before you decide to become a monk and after you become a monk how would you characterize your your praxis regarding the dhamma okay. so uh, the, the the practice of kindness has been there devoid of dhamma in a way as in associated with the buddhist teaching in a way hmm. so uh, with my previous lives of my previous you knew you knew buddhism from childhood huh no you didn't i i i i i, I was brought up in a uh, with a buddhist family uh, though we were brought up in a buddhist uh, anglican school so we were very influenced by the anglican teaching in a way uh, okay yeah but at the same time uh, my life beyond i was seeking something and i don't think i knew what i was seeking in a way but you grew up in a, in sri lanka in a classical mm-hmm. buddhist culture huh? after, after, after school you would say that but okay. school was an anglican school so i ah. was the head of the choir and all those things ah okay and, okay and, okay and, and buddhism was just a subject we studied ah okay yeah so actually closer to christianity in to some way. extent yes ah. so only after that that after coming to the uk seeking something that that you know found something in 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 meditation and in the hindu practice and i, I used to follow somebody associated with that until such time so you had spiritual teachers oh many spiritual gurus teachers, gurus yeah. but but never in a, in a in a way that the buddha appeared out after, after 2000 ah okay 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 so only after the the exposure to the dhamma and a few sutras that an architect inside me just got exposed out and and into that architecture the foundation and what got built on top has been adequate to offer the the security the protection the refuge 
that is needed. So, uh, so I read you like this, and I think also my own path has been much like that. So that you were seeking something, you didn't know exactly what it was, but there was some something missing, maybe some meaning uh, or purpose of life missing. And then you were basically going from teacher to teacher, or from group of teacher, or from teachings to teachings, yeah. but you were not satisfied. Never. Never. The Buddha also did the same, actually. Yeah. Huh? But then you found the Dhamma, and suddenly... The eyes open. The eyes open, and you, you, are, you the things fall into place. Exactly. Mm. For the mere reason that the, the, the way the Dhamma was exposed had a foundation, and that foundation had an architecture that you could refer to, mm. that had adi adequate you know, you know, space mm. to be, to own, to, to use, mm. uh, to find refuge in it, to find protection in it. The totality was answered mm. in that architecture. Now, I feel exactly the same. You can say, uh, uh, it's not to be kind of like a Buddhist with a big, big B or say that we are better. But however, my subjective feeling was that if you look at other teachings, then I can say ah, something is true here, something belief here and something is there. It's, it's, it appears from outside also, especially, of course, if you're swapping them out, if you go from, to, from guru to guru, from teaching to teaching, then it feels like a, something like a chaos. However, uh, for me, and it seems also for Bente, then finding the Dhamma, suddenly get the open side, then one finds order, there's some, some structure, and it makes sense in a way that is, uh, I think, to some degree, not findable in, in any other place in Samsara. You cannot, even I entertain science for a long time, but if you scratch science deep enough, then you will also see there's a lot of unanswered questions where where you actually your scientific mind is more based on belief than is based on the experimental facts. So, and also if you ask scientists basically what they agree upon, then they, they will say they agree on very little, if anything. They have a lot of disagreement about. So there's no consensus about what absolute truth is within science or within any, in, within any religion. But there is kind of like, I think, a luxury and a relief to come to the Dhamma and find a very, very ordered structure, both philosophically and also in praxis, that says ah, if you do like this and this, or it is like this and this, and you can do like this and that, then you will get this result. And then actually it keeps its promise, this is a big relief. Then suddenly you feel you have ground under your feet. Uh, and that this project of finding meaning and making happiness this actually is not something a religious or superstitious belief. It's not based on something like that. It is based on a practice that you have to do. And then you will come to see for yourself. Ihipasiko, as we see. Come and see for yourself. So you will come to see for yourself. And this I also f feel as a practitioner myself. I have come to see <laughs> something for myself. Okay, it was also in the books. But when I read it in the books without having experienced myself, then I didn't know what it was. It was only after repeated long-term practice of meditation and moral purity that I suddenly come to experience. Ah, it is exactly as in the books. And then I knew it. Then I knew it. Ah, it's, it's, it's true. So it's a, for me, it has been and still is a process of confirmation uh, of this point and that point and that point and that point of the Dhamma, of the Buddha. And this gives one an assurance that I would not be uh, without that uh, what I'm actually t trying to achieve is not only possible, uh, also is, is feasible and is something that can be done. It's realistic. It's realistic. It's, I'm not saying it's easy, but it's realistic. While at, in other teachings, including science, I would say, then uh, some, I often experience that if I f if, even if I did what uh, the teachers would say, or the teachings would say, then the prom promises was not fulfilled. What happened uh, was not fulfilled. The, the relief or the sense of meaning, it didn't appear. It didn't appear. Uh, so I think uh, this practice is important. Uh, one, uh, one cannot just jump and then expect uh, salvation or meaning or enlightenment to pop up uh, like that. And this is not, uh, not, not the, a goal in itself. A goal in itself to say, oh, if I can compare it partially, Along the way, what is said in this in this dhamma and discipline? Ah, well, then uh, I'm I'm on a on a I'm a firm path. I'd also say I'm, my sensation, my subjective sensation, after some years, let's say after ten years, even maybe even after five, 
It was being on the middle of the road, where if I look back at my life, both as a scientist and as a lover, as a family father and as a friend uh, and as, as a social being, then it was kind of like often seeking the extremes. For seeking one extreme politically, for example, socialism, then I was repulsed and seeking the opposite, uh, conservatism and so forth. Could be many, many, many kinds of opposites, but uh, basically a very unstable system uh, crossing over. And there, uh, the subjective feeling as a practicing Buddhist is that you're on the middle of the road, you're, you're sure that you're going in the right direction and you're locked on the target. And this assurance, I think, is very, very valuable because then this samsara, this world of the flesh, so to speak, all these choices, all these uh, gadgets, uh, they become much less dominant. They, become, they cannot uh, seduce you as easy. It's, the world is still there, the food is still there, uh, the internet is still there, I don't say, but it's, it's subjectively experienced as something external, uh, uh, flittering noise uh, from a far away uh, in a big, big uh, industrial hall. So there is there's still some noise, but it's not my noise, it's not my goal of life to follow after this noise, noise or colorful uh, things that are glittering down from the from the ceiling. No, no, it is there, but it's it's a faint, faint, faint thing compared to before, where it, by as we have spoken of before, by social convention was the very purpose of this lay life, was to take a bath in these uh, sensations, in these experiences, in this entertainment, and in, the, in maintaining this in uh, with pension schemes and uh, insurances and so on. So I think practice is crucial. Uh, huh? Before, otherwise, one won't get. We say there is three. There's this pariyati, the theory that we have been exposed to for uh, more than a decade, both me and Wende. And then there's this praxis, pati pati, that is very, very important. That's what takes you along. You cannot go along only with theory. And then the the penetration, the pati veda, will come dripping in eventually as one fulfills the praxis oneself. Uh, but the praxis is important, I think. Is is the thing itself actually? Is the way? So, Dante, just uh, it, uh, highlight what you just started the discussion. It's about this absolute word, absolute truth. So, when people came and said that the teachings of the Buddha was this absolute truth, then I said, what was the other truth that we had? And they said that the conventional truth. So, what's the difference between these two things? Uh, so, science to comparison of, of what this teaching is about. When this teacher just very simply said, if you look around this world that you are living in today, whatever that is there is because it had a beginning. It had some start. So a tree, a bit of sand, rock, doesn't matter what it is, animal, it has had a beginning. No beginning, it can't be here. No beginning, no end. But no beginning, it's not here. So therefore, it can't end. Mm. Uh, mm. So this, it doesn't need any academical understanding one day. Our simple intelligence enough to say that what is in this universe is something that has a beginning. Mm. Then he says that if anything begins, the time it spends is always increasing, causing aging, causing decay, causing change. And no science, no machine, no one person can influence this. Can repair it. Can repair it, can no, change no. it, can't do anything. So what you're saying is, so as soon as there's beginning, there's also change. Exactly. There's also aging. Totally. There's also decay. Yeah. Okay. So there's also suffering. Yeah. But the thing is that one day, the conventional world that we live within is unable to comprehend the rate of change. Hmm. So therefore, we create a permanency in a cocoon, in a balloon, mm. and live within that permanent balloon. Mm. A this fake permanency. What, exactly. This mm. is what this social world is caught, not knowing how to come out of that cocoon. Mm. Fearful mm. of the thing. So, at the same time, because you can measure the beginning and where you are, science and the totality of this conventional world knows to measure aging. Mm. But what this is doing is always reducing the time to the, towards the ending. 
So whatever that is increasing is causing a decrease somewhere else. Because we do not know this uncertainty of the ending, it is something that is always pushed aside and not spoken about. Causing fear, oh, anxiety. Doubt and fear. Hmm. This world just doesn't want to talk about death. No, 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 no. no. So, it, or anything in general. Exactly. Right. So they, 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 they talk about this, this current present moment, you know, and here and now and you name it. Psychologically, they'll make up any story to cover up that absolute truth. Mm -hmm. Only once you open your eye to this beginning and ending with durations in between, causing this naturality of aging that is there, not to fight it, but just to accept that that is just what it is. It's not just for you, but the totality of this universe. Mm. Everybody is. Mm. So why, why fear? Everybody and everything. Everything. So, mm. so, so, so why fear? Mm. So the moment you remove this fear from their bandit, their karmic consequences begin to build something up inside to drive us in that path of spirituality, mm. in that path of Dhamma. Mm. So until you open this out, nothing happens. Mm. It is just an academical understanding people have mm. of the teaching. Mm. I'd like to add that uh, when I read about this cessation and realized that it is true, that that everything that begins it also ends yeah. and and this inevitably uh, will, will cause suffering then you can say looking back at my the western purpose where where uh, to initiate something huh? that's actually basically the purpose to begin something to begin a new life or to begin building a new house or to build construction of this and that not realizing actually that it will also end so one is accumulating uh, accumulating suffering then it's compared to uh, the, the, the Buddhist purposes actually silencing. Uh, so, so to this process of constructing uh, to, uh, to begin, th this is converted or opposed by, I would say to some extent, by the process of silencing, which is defined as not beginning something, not uh, putting new seeds in the earth. And not not uh, building up castles that yeah. falls down anyway. Huh? Yeah. So it's a whole, it's a it's a bottom up of the, the whole process of purpose of life. Yeah. However, what's it in is in the end of this uh, process of silencing, which one also I think on a personal level feels very much in practice when meditating. That is absolute peace, yeah. absolute peace, complete freedom, uh, and the highest happiness. Nibbana, Paranang, Suktang, as, as the Buddhists say. This highest happiness is, and this complete peace is something that one can experience both bit by bit by meditating, also by, by being mindful. So this suddenly, it, it, the excitement of beginning something and building something up, uh, and uh, even though it's a card house, this suddenly is exchanged, or uh, there's an alternative of something that has a, a higher degree of subtlety and I think also value, you, you suddenly realize, ah, all these colors, uh, all these forms, all these opinions, uh, all these uh, s uh, s structures that you have on the Samisa, the flesh part of the world in Samsara, basically, they, have a, they are more primitive, they are more uh, exchanging, they are more unstable than this piece that you have of Nibbana. And then you start to cook it down and silencing. And, Assuading and say, okay, silencing, nothingness is is something good. It's not something that should be feared. Uh, and say, ah, if there is silence, then I have to put some noise in there or some entertainment in there. No, 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 no. If there's silence, then you're close to the goal. You're not far from it. Right, right. So the question you asked, Bante, about the practice that we have now, for this Bante, uh, the most important has been how to spend the 24 hours. So how to spend the daylight hours and how to spend the darkened hours. So this approach has helped him to manage the 24 hours in a cycle of a day, in the daylight hours of Pindapata and whatever the chores of what that you have to do mm. is, is taken on board and done. And the darkened hours is spent because he feels that the darkened hours have more silence. In the environment. When all are asleep, there is much more peace and calmness to go about doing many things. Hmm. So, 
in a way, uh, uh, there is a more intense practice at night at, at the darkened hours yeah. than, than during the daylight hours. Yeah. In yeah. the daylight hours, you allow other people to go about their own activity and etc. So, but out of the out of their way. Mm. So, uh, the approach has been always to speak to the inner self, saying, "Do nothing, do nothing, do nothing," because in the past, if it saw something and needed to be done, immediately he would go and do it. Not because it had to be done. I would imagine that it was just an occupation. It was just the way that this, this self... To, to keep to keep boredom at bay. Yeah. Uh. yeah and, and you just see now, you, you, you just mentioned about that, that little kuti and that piece of wood that's fallen. Uh, by now, in the past, he would have brought a ladder, you know, taken a new piece of wood and you mm. know, fixed it and whatever. Mm. Painted it. Mm. But now that a monk, oh, wow, this is uneasy. Well, let's see what has to be done. Mm -hmm. Not that it doesn't have to be repaired. No, no, no. Well, no. Well, you know, how many ways there are to repair, how to repair. So, that time that we now take to reassess the circumstances around your universe that we live within wasn't there in the past. So, therefore, that alone has become a meditation. Mm -hmm. The alternating mind from the eye to the ear has reduced. Mm. That has become part of this meditation of the world. Being mindful and the, the associating and taking this physicality to a certain depth, as in uh, taking inhalations and exhalations and understanding that if you were to take your body and stretch it out, you can only do it with an inhalation. So from lying down to sit down, you have to inhale. From sitting down to stand up, you have to inhale. From standing to walk, you have to inhale. But if you were to do the opposite, then you have to exhale to crush this body. Mm. So in this way, there is a further association of the body, of the breathing, of the movements, and all three of these together in a way, that the mind just keeps looking. So when you speak, you have to exhale to speak. So you have to slow down and inhale in between. So that mindfulness, that awareness, that awakenedness has been brought and that has become an occupation. In itself. In itself. Mm. Very purposeful, purposeful one. Exactly. Ah. So therefore, there is very little need to go and find an hour to do some special vegetation. Mm. Because this is what, what it is about. Hmm. You, one is on the job all the time, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. So, very, very happy about uh, intake and he's aware that it has to, you know, to do anything to put inside this body, you have to inhale. To push anything out of this body, you have to exhale. Yeah? So, you have to hold the breath and do something. So, you are so aware of your breath, posture and the movement. So, Clear comprehension. Sampajana. Sampajana. Sati Sampajana. So I'm happy. I'd like to say thank you. So I'm, I'm so happy to have shared this Dhamma with Yes, we came far around. Actually, I didn't uh, speculate much about the question, but I think we have covered a lot of ground. Yes, uh, So I also like to say thank you to you for your advantageous attention, for your clever consideration, and for your kind contribution. And may you indeed, by these words of the Dhamma here from Frederikson in Denmark, a day in June, be peaceful and happy. Thank you. Friends, what is this fundamental right awareness? That noble eightfold way leading to Nibbana is simply this right view right motivation right speech right action right livelihood right effort right awareness and right concentration but what is right awareness the fourfold definition of right awareness is 1. 
awareness of the body merely as a transient and constructed frame. 2. Awareness of feelings just as conditioned emotional responses. 3. Awareness of mind only as a habituated and temporary set of moods. 4. Awareness of all phenomena only as constructed mental states. Right awareness is of these four while being alert and clearly comprehending. This will put away any longing towards and any aversion against anything in this world. The Blessed Buddha once said, Friends, this is the only direct way to the mental purification of beings, to the overcoming and elimination of all sorrow, all frustration, all pain and all misery, to gaining the right method, to the realization of Nibbana, that is, this establishing of exactly these four foundations of awareness, these four great frames of reference. The core concept is thus, these four foundations of right awareness are 1. Being aware of the body only as a transient form or frame. 2. Being aware of the feeling just as a reactive response. 3. Being aware of the mind merely as a passing set of moods. 4. Being aware of any phenomenon solely as a mental state and nothing else. Friends, awareness is indeed a mountain of advantage. The explanation of acute awareness and clear comprehension goes like this. When inhaling and exhaling long, one notices and is fully aware of just that. When inhaling and exhaling short, one notices, labels and is fully aware of just that. One trains. I will breathe in and out clearly comprehending the entire body. One trains. I will breathe in and out, calming the breath and all bodily activity. When walking, one notices and clearly comprehends that one is walking. When standing, one notices and clearly comprehends that one is standing. When sitting, one notices and clearly comprehends that one is sitting. When lying down, one notices and clearly comprehends that one is lying down. Going forward, one notices and clearly comprehends this going forward. When returning, one notices and clearly comprehends this returning. When looking in front or to the back, one notices and is clearly aware of just that. When bending or stretching, when lifting or carrying, when eating or drinking, chewing or tasting, one is aware and mentally labels just that, bending, bending, chewing, chewing, eating, eating. When passing excrement or urine, one clearly comprehends exactly that. When falling asleep and when waking up, when speaking or keeping silent, one notices, knows and understands exactly that and clearly comprehends that this is what one is doing right there and exactly right now. Continuous awareness of purpose, suitability, domain and nature of one's current behavior with a mental, verbal, a
bodily activity is right awareness and clear comprehension. The characterization of right awareness. Awareness of wrong view or right view, present now, is right awareness. Awareness of wrong motivation or right motivation is right awareness. Awareness of wrong speech or right speech now is right awareness. Awareness of wrong action or right action done now is right awareness. Awareness of wrong livelihood or right livelihood is right awareness. Awareness of wrong effort or right effort at this very moment is right awareness. Awareness of wrong awareness or right awareness is right awareness. Awareness of wrong or right concentration right now is right awareness. The function of right awareness and its associated mental states. Knowing right versus wrong awareness as right versus wrong awareness is right view. Exchanging wrong awareness with right awareness is right effort. Right awareness has the function of observing, noticing, remembering and knowing the true reality that neither any body nor any form nor any feeling, nor any mentality, nor any phenomena, nor any mental state is real, lasting happiness, nor truly attractive, nor lasting, nor satisfying, nor something to be kept, nor even personal. All phenomena are momentary. They pass away right at the moment of their arising and occurrence. Nothing is permanent. Everything is in a state of flux, arising and ceasing, emerging and vanishing, coming and going, again and again and again and ever again. Continuously seeing these transients, this impermanence, and thus this dissatisfactoriness and impersonality is right awareness. For further study on right awareness, Sammasati, go to whatbuddhaset.net and search for awareness. Thank you.